CTO on the Research Ready program. Welcome to this month's Research Ready Mentor Spotlight. This is part two in our two-part series focusing on clinical trial finance. Today's session is titled, How to Achieve Financial Sustainability, the Experience and Learning from the Oncology Clinical Trial Support Unit at SickKids. The Mentor Spotlight series is a monthly webinar where an expert shares best practices and highlights exceptional processes relevant to the research community in Ontario and Canada. We aim to be interactive in the live sessions, but we also make the recording available following this webinar. For more information on Research Ready and to view previous recordings, you can always visit CTO's website. We also have a certificate of attendance for anyone joining the live session. We simply ask that you complete a short survey that will appear at the end of the session, and this will allow us to create the certificate if you are collecting um, continuity. We are also looking for any feedback you have or topics you would like to see in upcoming sessions, and we welcome that feedback regardless of whether you um, collect the certificate. In terms of housekeeping, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so feel free to unmute yourselves at that time, or you can use the chat feature to um, type in your questions. So today we would like to welcome our speakers, Antela Zafino and Jackie Yanucha, who will be sharing their expertise with us. Antela Zafino is the manager of the Clinical Trial Support Unit and the clinical informatics team in the Division of Hematology, Oncology, Bone Marrow Transplant, and Cellular Therapy at the Hospital for Sick Children. Antela is a healthcare leader passionate about improving the healthcare system in Canada by effectively leading forward thinking teams, spearheading innovative in initiatives, and bringing transformational change. As the CTSU manager, Antela has implemented new processes and innovative approaches to managing clinical trial units in an effective and financially sustainable manner, making Sick Kids CTSU one of the leaders in the field. Antela has also worked in other healthcare settings, including the government leading quality improvement, strategic planning, and project management work. Antela is a lifelong learner, passionate about education, leadership, and mentoring, and she is currently completing a master's in health administration from McMaster University. Jackie Anusha is the administrative coordinator for the clinical trial support unit in the division of hematology, oncology, bone marrow transplant, and cellular therapy at the hospital for sick children. She has been with the CTSU for over five years and brings extensive knowledge and expertise in clinical trials, finance, management, and operations. Jackie has an honors Bachelor of Science degree from York University and is currently completing a certificate of project management from the University of Toronto. So with that introduction, I will pass it over to Antila and Jackie. Thank you so much. I just want to make sure that you're able to hear us while Jackie brings up the slides very quickly. Can you confirm that you're able to hear? Yep. Sounds okay, good. perfect. I will just wait a minute. Um, so, hi everyone. Thanks so much for having us here today to present on different CTSU processes that we've implemented here at SickKids in the last few years. Um, and uh, hopefully, there will be some learnings uh, for from uh, for all of you to take on. Um, just to set some expectations, this will definitely not be a finance one-on-one -on -one presentation. Uh, we're just here to tell our story and some of um, the processes we've implemented and hopefully these learnings will be applicable to, to your place as well. Um, so I'll, I'll pass it over to Jackie. Um, so before we begin, we wanted to do our land acknowledgement. So we would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which Sick Kids operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, Toronto is home to Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Sick Kids is committed to working toward new relationships that include First Nations, Inuit, and Matisse peoples, and is grateful for the opportunity to share this land in caring for children and their families. Um, so before we begin, we thought it'd be a good idea to do some questions to better understand the audience here today. If you would like to participate in the audience engagement, please go to menti.com and the meeting code you're going to type is 1743 um, so once again, it is 1743-7700. Um, so I'll just give everyone a moment to set it up and then I'll go to the first question.
Okay, so the first question is, which of these areas does your work function fall under? Okay, perfect. So it's um, a few more seconds. Okay, well, it's so great to see such a diverse group of professionals with different work functions on this call, which is really nice to see. So for the second question, on a scale of one to 10, what would you say your involvement with finance and operational management of your clinical trial is? Uh, we have, um, it's great to see. We have definitely a range of people with different experiences on the call, which is great. Um, okay, perfect. Um, so for the last question for now, what have you experienced or what do you anticipate to be the biggest challenge for achieving financial stability in a clinical research unit? So here you can think of a word or phrase that comes to mind based on your personal experience. So any word or phrase you think of, maybe, you know, um, okay, perfect. Funding, budget. So budgeting is a big one for sure. Funding. <laughs> nice. Funding. So definitely a lot of different um, so definitely from this, we see like budgeting, um, budgeting, funding are very big challenges people tend to experience. Um, thank you guys so much for your insight and your answers. Okay, so if you have you ever tried to search the literature on what is the most current evidence on best practices on how to manage a clinical trial operations, clinical trial support unit, or its operations and finances, or any other matters that may relate to running a clinical trial support unit. If you have, you would have noticed that there is very little, that there is currently very little literature out there on all of these issues. With this in mind, today Intel and I are going to share with you our learnings based on our, our personal experience of running a clinical trial support unit here at SickKids. So the key objectives for today's presentation will be to describe how SIGKID's Oncology CTSU achieved financial sustainability, explore how technology and established systems and processes can assist with finance tracking and oversight, discuss the impact of newly implemented financial management processes on CTSU operations. So um, I'm going to just pass it over to Antella and she's going to go through the next set of slides. Thank you, Jackie. Um, so just to give you all an overview or a good sense of um, our CTSU and the work that we do here. So our team is comprised of over 30 clinical research professionals um, who are split in uh, different sections or pods that reflect the way our clinical teams are organized. So we currently have about 85 active clinical trials open uh, to patient recruitment um, and 63 of them are interventional clinical trials from phase one to three. Um, and a lot of those are BMT cellular therapy and phase one clinical trials. Um, so in general, we have about 15 to 20% of the newly diagnosed cancer patients that receive frontline cancer treatment registered on a clinical trial. Next slide, please. Um, so going back uh, a few years to uh, 2019, we realized back then that our CTSU finances were not in a very good shape. 
Um, so if you're looking at the picture here on the left, that was me in front of a whiteboard. Um, so we had to take a step back and understand what are some of the, you know, what our current state was at the time and identify some of the issues and resolutions that we needed um, and solutions that we needed to implement while strategizing about long term planning and sustainability for our, our unit finances. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the most important steps, and sorry, I will turn on the camera every so often. I am a little bit under the weather, so um, you probably can't see it, but might hear it from my voice. So um, I'll try to go on and off. Um, so one of the most important steps that we had to take at the time was to understand the current state. Um, so that included getting um, access to all of our study cost centers at the time and really understand the different sources of funding and how the funding uh, flows, why, when do the funds move from one cost center to, the, to another. Um, so I'll spend a little bit of time explaining this little diagram that we have here because you will be seeing it um, in a few slides uh, to come as well. Um, so um, in CTSU, our operation, we have one operational cost center where the operational compensations and non-compensation expenses come out of. Um, and um, at the same time, we have a lot of uh, clinical trial specific cost centers um, where we have about 120 of them at the moment. And these are um, uh, the cost centers where the study related revenues and expenses go in and out uh, of. Um, and so this applies to all, all of the studies that we have open, including industry funded, consortia and grant funded studies. Um, and lastly, we also have um, a foundation um, which we work with closely, our Garen Family uh, Cancer Center. So we have foundation funds uh, that support both CTSU operational work as well as uh, study specific work, um, especially for some of the studies that are underfunded. So those are sort of the different arrows that you see in this diagram here and, and explains how the funding flows between the different cost centers. Next slide, please. Um, so just to give you a moment to process uh, that diagram and all the information that we just presented, um, we'll take another moment to go through another quick mentee question. Uh, please enter in the box, what do you think the biggest expense in the operational budget of a clinical trial support unit is? I'll give everybody a minute. Okay, so salaries, staffing, compensation, um, that's definitely correct. Okay, yeah, so salary, staffing, that makes a lot of sense. So um, to appreciate the importance of cost recovery, um, uh, we, I, I guess we'll we'll do a quick focus on sort of moving the funds between the C CTSU cost center and the research um, cost centers. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, Jackie, just to give you a, an appreciation of the importance of the cost recovery um, for CRA and um, compensations, inadequate cost recovery of CRC salary um, for us led to an accumulated deficit of about $745,000 um, within a span of three years um, in our operational cost center. Next slide, please. Um, so in October 2020, we implemented a new cost recovery process. As part of this process, we, re, um, re, we revised our CRC time trackers um, and made their completion mandatory in a monthly review mandatory as well. Um, so for example, if you think of a CRA working 35 hours a week, which will be 140 hours a month, uh, majority, if you kind of think of the work that they do and how it's split up, majority of the hours go into the section specific hours, um, which further gets broken down into study specific work and operational sp section specific hours. Um, so to cover the study specific hours, what we do in CTSU is we generate monthly invoices that are approved by the PIs um, to recover the CRA or the CRC uh, time spend on study management. So this would include things such as data entry, patient enrollment, regulatory paperwork, etc. 
Um, the hours that CRC spend within each section to attend section specific meetings, um, such as patient rounds, uh, research rounds, um, other meetings within that section. Uh, what we do is we split those hours between all of the studies that a given CRC works on. Next slide, please, Jackie. Um, so this is just an example of our CRC time trackers that I just mentioned, which we use to track our time um, on the left here. And on the right is a screenshot of, of the invoices that we use to um, transfer um, CRA compensation in a monthly basis from the research cost center into our operational cost center. Um, and, and definitely without the endorsement of our PIs of this new process, um, this would not uh, be possible. Next slide, please. Um, and then how about the non-section specific uh, operational costs in that uh, diagram that we showed earlier, there's a section specific and study specific work, but then there's some hours that CRA spend on non-section or non-study specific work. So this would be um, time spent to develop um, uh, SOPs, professional development, training, conferences, etc. Um, so in CTSU here at SickKids, we're lucky that we're able to recover some of these operational costs through the foundation funds. Um, so a lot of effort um, has been spent to build a close relationship with our GFCC, but also to establish tracking tools and mechanisms for accurate uh, quarterly foundation funds disbursements. Um, and so uh, Another flow that we talked about a little bit earlier is the uh, flow of funds from our foundation to the study cost center. Um, so we do also develop, we did develop a lot of separate mechanisms for forecasting study deficits and keeping track of them so that foundation funds can be set aside to support those underfunded studies. Next, next slide, please. Um, so very quickly, just to get a sense maybe, and it might be helpful for everybody on this call to understand how other units maybe or uh, have uh, have been organized. Um, can you maybe please respond to this question? Where are your clinical research staff primarily paid out of? Just to get a sense of whether people have operational call centers set up or if the uh, CRA time comes directly out of the study call centers. Um, so I see a little bit of uh, maybe half come out directly from study cost centers. Um, some have research unit operational cost centers. Um, a lot of them, a mix of all of the above, which makes sense. Uh, one foundation in from hospital operational budget, which is actually good to know. Um, I've always wondered whether or not there's hospitals where uh, clinical research coordinators are incorporated into the operational budget. So it seems like there might be one or two models out there to follow um, that approach. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, sorry. So that's you, Jackie. I think I'll, I'll hand it over to you just to go through the clinical trial finance operations. Yes, so in the next few slides, I'm going to be focusing on the right side of this graph here, which is the clinical trials, um, finance, clinical trials finance operations, study revenues, as well as the expenses. So in CTSU, we are very lucky to have Shiro's Nanji as our senior budgets and contracts um, specialist. Shai has extensive ex expertise in budgets and contract negotiation, and she is highly involved in the financial oversight of all of our studies throughout the study's duration. Um, so if you want to have more information on this topic, you can always look at the last month's um, CTO Mentor Spotlight session on the CTO website. Sorry. Okay. So so in addition to Shai, there are other key players in CTSU that are involved in the client and clinical trials finance oversight, including the CRAs, um, the PI, our finance partners, um, and as well as recently we have hired a CTSU finance CRA1, Courtney. So everyone is involved in managing the clinical trials. Um, so at, at CTSU, we use many tools and processes to oversee the trials finances. On the left is a patient tracker example. 
Um, this is maintained by the CRAs as a way to know which study assessments have been done and what we need to invoice for or what has been invoiced for. Um, and on the right is a payment tracker example. This is used by Shai and Courtney, our CRA1, which is a way for us to keep track of the payments that have been paid and payments that need to be paid or any payments that are still pending. So in addition to those trackers, we also use EPIC. EPIC allows us to do the frequent billing review, which is what, uh, which is what the CRAs do about one to twice a week as a way to know which uh, tests were done which tests are standard of care or non-standard of care. Um, and we, this allows us to know how to build the tests because if they were standard of care, they would be billed to the ministry. Whereas if they're non-standard of care, such as research study tests, they would be billed to the study cost center. So this, um, this billing review is very important. Um, so on the screen, we have a screenshot of MyBI. So MyBI is a Sick Kids developed application that allows us to manage all of the study cost center. It allows us to see all the transactions, the um, balances, and also it allows us to run reports on a quarterly basis um, with our PIs and finance partners. We can always do it as frequently as we need it if we needed to do it more frequently than quarterly, but um, my BI is a very good tool. And it also lets us to keep track of invoicing and payments and any other thing we need. Um, so this is more towards the future, but we are currently in the implementation phase as well. So currently we would like to be implementing in the future EDGE. EDGE is a clinical trials management system, and it has a lot of capabilities, especially when it comes to finance. So EDGE will, be allow, EDGE will allow us to run reports and to track a lot of the data, as well as to develop study budgets and also to do invoicing more frequently and to make sure we are doing all the invoicing that needs to be done on a more regular basis. So the implementation for EDGE at CTSU, we are doing it in a phased approach. So currently we are in the phase one and phase two approach, which is to transfer all of our studies as well as our study patient tracking um, onto EDGE and use EDGE to run reports to know how many patients we are enrolling, um, and also to know how many studies are currently open at sick kids and study statuses, et cetera. Um, so in the future, and we're currently working right now to do the implementation of the finance piece, which would include, um, which would include having to be able to do the study budget, budget development and also to run reports on finances, which would allow us to do more frequent invoicing and um, to streamline processes as well. Um, we also, in the future, we will be doing the um, we will be doing the protocol complexity and work workload assessment, workload CRC assessment, which is um, we're currently in the piloting phases of this, but this will allow the CTSU manager to redistribute workload um, as needed on a more frequent basis. Um, and Antella. Thank you. I'll uh, take it off from here. Thanks, Jackie. So um, a couple more processes that are worth mentioning, which uh, had an impact on our CTSU and our study finances. Um, so we now do a gap funding analysis for all of the studies um, at study startup. So if there is a gap in funding, PIs would have to identify additional funds um, and funding sources prior to uh, an SFO sign-off, um, the Scientific Feasibility and Operation Review sign-off. Um, so uh, the other process on an annual basis, what we've started doing is that we review our CT, um, at our CTSU steering committee, uh, patient enrollments, as well as financial status of all our clinical trials to determine whether or not we continue to keep them open uh, or close them early. And we have found um, since we've implemented this process, this would be our second year, uh, there's been several clinical trials where we've made the determination to actually close them um, and very well document the reason why we've done so. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, and lastly, we're currently in the process of implementing a new residual funds policy, which is applicable primarily to the industry funded clinical trials run through the CTSU. Um, so according to this policy, which we've drafted and we've been working on for quite some time, and it's now finally uh, approved and implemented, um, the residual funds of a, of a trial, once the trial is completely finished, every all the court, um, expenses are, are applied and archiving is done, everything is done on that clinical trial, then we what we do is we're splitting the residual funds between the PI, the sections, and the CTSU based on the percentage shown here. And the section specific portion of the residual funds are deposited into CTSU managed cost centers, um, which we do a frequent review of these um, cost centers to see what accumulated funds um, have been accumulated there to determine how to use these funds um, to support academic and underfunded clinical trials um, under each section. Um, so, for example, if the gap funding of a study um, is identified, as we talked about the pr uh, earlier process, um, one of the sources of funding that we would go to um, or that a PI could potentially tap into is this section specific funds, um, which has been uh, quite welcomed by all of our PIs and, and an additional um, source of funding for us to use for underfunded clinical trials. Next slide, please. Um, so, looking back uh, in terms of implementation of these and other um, uh, processes, uh, what their impact has been on our CTSU operations. Um, for starters, they've helped us enhance our understanding of the different CTSU finances and aspects. Um, we were able to clear the CTSU operational cost center deficit that we talked about um, earlier. Um, as well as set aside uh, funds that we could use for academic and underfunded research studies. Um, this process has also helped us um, introduce more PI accountability. Um, and so what, what we mean by that before 2019, because we have um, a foundation and the ability to, to rely on foundation, a lot of the times the PIs didn't really pay as close attention to the study finances as we do now, because there's a lot more scrutiny in terms of the um, uh, expenses, the funding available, we do the frequent reviews. So our PIs are definitely a lot more aware of what goes in and out of those study cost centers. Um, it also helped us have improved collaboration within and between sections. So, for example, getting them to approve the residual funds and splitting the funds um, of a study between the different sections. Um, that wasn't an easy task to accomplish, but we are definitely reaping the, the benefits of that now. Um, uh, a few other benefits, it helped bring awareness and collect data on the true clinical trial costs, which now SHI can use to help improve budget negotiation um, with our industry funders. Um, so, for example, looking at our uh, CRA time trackers and how much everybody's spending, uh, we're able to very easily um, assess or, or uh, estimate how much CRC or research nursing time is required for a specific clinical trial. Um, and lastly, uh, but very importantly, um, we were able to um, establish a few more HR um, or reap a few more HR benefits around the ability to hire more um, CRCs, ability to improve our um, staffing compensation, although it's been a bit hard with Bill 124, but also opportunity to support professional development of our staff. And um, that includes conferences, uh, courses, a few of our staff members are, um, are completing their masters and so forth. Next slide, please. Um, and so before we move to the wrapping, uh, we're, we're wrapping up now. We will ask a couple more quick questions and then we'll um, get to the conclusion and then hopefully some time for questions and answers. So uh, before we move on, we wanted to ask one last Menti questions. Um, what resonated with you most uh, from these presentations or some of these processes that we've presented so far? And uh, maybe a quick... Um, word cloud. 
So true cost, finance oversight, PI specific cost centers, detailed tracking, oversight. Leave it another couple minutes or seconds rather. Gap analysis, tracking, costing, finance oversight. Great. Thank you. We'll move on to the next slide, Jackie. Um, so lessons learned, and you all touched on a lot of these. So in terms of the lessons learned um, for us, uh, the CTSU operational oversight and finance management is definitely very complicated, uh, but it's really important to get into the weeds and understanding how money flows. Um, make finance management a priority. So a lot of the times, um, you know, setting it aside and prioritizing patients and doing other more important work, um, it's easier. But I think one of the things that um, has made a huge change for us is really not canceling those meetings and making sure that those uh, review meetings with our finance partners and the PIs happen and, and they, they are consistent. Um, Rely on technology and systems as much as possible. Uh, that's definitely something that will help us, especially in the future, as Jackie mentioned, uh, whether it's Edge or other systems that we'll use in the future, it's really important uh, to rely on technology. Um, involve everyone, including PIs and CRCs and finance teams, so building strong relationships and trust with all of them is crucial. Um, and leverage the power of data and reporting for um, information uh, for informed decision making and um, having the ability to run those reports uh, through the different systems that we have. It gives us a really good helicopter view or sense of what our um, financial standing overalls is across all the studies and all the sections. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I did want to recognize that we did not get a chance to touch on many other aspects during this presentation, such as grant application and grant management, which is a, a whole art on its own and it um, deserves a separate presentation really. Um, and that there's currently a lot of effort um, and consortiums that are being supported by federal government, such as Accelerating Clinical Trials and the Canadian Pediatric Cancer Consortium and, and a few other consortiums recently com uh, communicated, um, which aim to build clinical trial infrastructure and funding to support clinical um, trials, Canadian-led clinical trials within Canada. Um, so building partnerships with the industry, government, and other funders are important um, other strategies that we didn't really uh, touch on here, but um, uh, an area that we're exploring further. Um, and more recently, uh, as I was reading about this, another more uh, unconventional fundraising strategy that, um, believe it or not, is now in literature, there's some publications on it, um, is around crowd, uh, crowdfunding, um, especially for phase one clinical trials, um, which we haven't explored yet, but it'll be really interesting to consider for the future. Next slide, please. Um, and so lastly, this is our last slide before we get to questions and answers. Um, it is worth mentioning that despite the different systems that we have implemented, there's still a lot of work that we in CTSU and here at SickKids need to be done to better manage our clinical trials, including the finance component. So SickKids um, is recently embarked on a um, SickKids wide initiative um, led by the Interventional Clinical Trials Infrastructure Task Force, which is meant to look at uh, current gap in how we manage our clinical trials, um, identify areas for improvement and, and new processes and solutions to better manage our clinical trials. Um, so I'm really excited about this initiative and perhaps, um, you know, something that we can present on in the near future. Next slide, please. So this brings us to the very end. Um, I did want to take a, a second just to thank everybody for their hard work within the CTSU. Um, all of the CRAs who spend a lot of time and effort every day um, to make sure that they follow, it feels like a thousand and one different processes and checklists and policies and tasks uh, and, and trackers that we have within CTSU. Um, 
and uh, definitely Shai and Jackie, without whom, and Courtney now, uh, without whom we wouldn't be able to um, have such a good financial oversight. Um, all of our PIs, Dr. Morganston, who's our CTSU medical director, our finance team, and Donna, who's our um, superstar representative of the Guerin Family Cancer Center. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for your efforts and your help. Um, so we hope that this has brought some learnings um, that will be valuable to you, but I'm sure there's a lot of other processes that others on this call uh, probably have at their sites, and it seems like we probably have a good um, 15 minutes or so. Um, so happy to take any questions or others to share their thoughts and ideas of what they uh, bring forward um, on this topic. So. I think we're done here. I don't know if you wanted to facilitate the Q&A. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Antella and Jackie. That was a very informative presentation. Um, we'll move on now to the Q&A portion. So at this time, we welcome you to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask your question. And you can also pop it into the chat function in Zoom if you'd like to ask your question that way. Uh, and we can uh, have Jackie and uh, Antella answer. I did not see anything come through the chat just yet. I'm just scrolling through. Clear as mud. So we do have a question from Michaela. Um, are budget trackers available to be shared with us? Could we use these? Um, I believe so. Shai, I don't mean to put you on the spot. You could maybe even put a comment in. I know there's a lot of the trackers that we've developed on our own and there's a few that we've adopted from others. So I can definitely um, connect with Shai and our team here and identify the ones that we could share and, and happy to, to circulate those ones after. Great. Um, Roshini has asked, are CRCs in the loop for invoicing and payment? What tools do you use for updating all parties? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, I think the presentation that Shai gave on this last month covered in a lot more detail, um, Heidi, in case you haven't um, watched that presentation, but Shai went into a, a lot of details in terms of how we track everything, how do we do budget negotiations, who tracks it, how do we invoice the frequency, how do we can communicate with our sponsors. Uh, but just to quickly um, answer the question, the CRAs um, are involved. So one of the main ways that our um, CRAs and CRCs are, in, are, are involved, they maintain the patient trackers. So the patient trackers are the ones where we set them up uh, specific for each study and we outline all the different assessments that would be required for each visit. So the CRAs are the ones that fill out the time trackers to um, capture what assessments happened. Um, and then as uh, Jack mentioned, Shai and Courtney are finance um, uh, CRAs within CTSU. They use those trackers to then look at our study budgets and reconcile what needs to be invoiced, what's an invoiceable, what's not um, for our sponsors. So then uh, there's a lot of collaboration between our finance CRAs and our study CRAs to make sure that whatever final invoices we generate are a true reflection of the the cost the study cost that we need to invoice for um, and then in terms of the communication with the sponsors um, I think uh, in terms of the financing uh, primarily all of the communications go through shy um, it depends on the studies like we have the uh, industry funded trials that are very complicated phase one uh, trials usually shy does a lot of those correspondences with the uh, with the sponsors some of our other trials if they're a consortium or um, a different funder um, the CRAs have a lot of the a lot more invoice uh, involvement with the financial oversight uh, for those trials I hope that helps great um Heidi's asking if you can speak about any of the training given to coordinators to adapt to tracking hours, study invoicing, et cetera. 
Um, so that's a very good question. We, I will say it, it's not easy and especially because it takes a lot of time to keep track of the hours and it takes a lot of time to prioritize it, especially if, you know, if you have an audit coming or if you have a patient coming. Um, but one of the main strategies that we've used, um, and again, it's it's not perfect, but we try to stay on top of it as much as possible, is really having the CRAs understanding the importance of the time trackers. So one of the first things that I always say when um, new people join our team is our CRC time trackers are not meant to be, um, you know, uh, a tool for me to find out, like it's not a micromanaging tool. It's not meant for us to see how you're spending your time. It's strictly an operational finance tool that we need to use to bring um, funding uh, from the study cost center. So really engaging with the CRAs and, and, and even doing a constant reminders um, every quarter or so we put it back into the agenda in our team meetings to go through the process, how we complete the tracker. So constantly engaging everybody in truly understanding the importance of these time trackers. And it, it, bottom line, if we're not able to be financially sustainable within CTSU, it's really hard for me to... Um, or for us to support professional growth and, and, and other um, uh, benefits, I guess, that we're reaping from this process. So um, it, it's a bit of work, but I definitely um, we've seen it work. Thank you. Um, Catherine's asking if you explored any other CTMS programs versus EDGE. Um, so we haven't, Catherine, and the reason why we are moving to EDGE, as I would assume it will be the same for a lot of um, other sites on this call, we picked EDGE because it is the chosen CTMS from 3CTN. Um, a few years ago, we joined as a pediatric site, and I know a few other pediatric sites across um, Canada, or I should say cancer pediatric programs, across Canada join 3CTN um, and we get incentive-based funding from them. Um, and so we did go with, uh, with EDGE because it's their preferred uh, uh, CTMS that they use. Um, and I mean, some of the capabilities are there. I'm sure there's a lot of other ones, but because of the funding piece, I think it's why we went with, with EDGE. Um, they are updating it. There's supposed to be a new, um, reiteration coming out which is supposed to have a lot of um, finance oversight updates uh, which will hopefully be helpful but um, it would be interesting to hear what other sites are using in terms of CTMSs maybe even in the chat just I know it's a topic that a lot of people are or a lot of sites are currently looking into yeah I'll let you know if anything comes through sure um, another question from Christine asking about if any policies you have on attending conferences. So do CRCs, all of them get the opportunity to attend? Is it dependent on PI's funding? How do you manage? Sure. Um, happy to share. And ja uh, Shai and Jackie, any time you guys want to chime in, please feel free to do so. Um, in terms of the conferences um i guess we have two three different mechanisms um we have an institutional process called scpdf don't ask me what it stands for it's a very long acronym but the scpdf process is um, the process we're required to go through if we would like the institution to support um any conferences or um, courses or any professional development opportunities. The hospital has a, a said budget aside for professional development, and obviously not everybody could, um, uh, you know, benefit from it, but we encourage that that's the first place to go to. Um, for the ones that are not approved, we have established a completely separate process with our 
um, Guerin Family uh, Cancer Center or GFCC um, uh, with Donna and, and others in GFCC, where we have a completely separate application process, um, CRAs and um, uh, research nurses and anybody that is part of the CTSU would uh, submit application there. So usually what we do is if there's a conference coming up, for example, I'll send out the email, let the team know whoever is interested would apply. And then both processes, whether it's the GFCC or the SCPDF, um, are reviewed outside of CTSU with very specific criteria uh, to select who would be the most appropriate um, candidate to, to go. And then because of the um, recently implemented residual uh, funds policy, we've already put some uh, funds aside in the CTSU operational budget. Um, so we have a, a separate third component of keeping track of who's gone where. Generally speaking, we try for each person on the team to have at minimum one professional development uh, goal that they attend or are part of or learn whatever it is that they put in their um, uh, yearly uh, goals. Um, so we try for everybody to at least have one and then look into a second or third if there is funding left. Great. Um, okay, so moving forward, uh, there's a question here asking whether the CTSU receives assistance if there are financial gaps from the foundation, for example, or do you receive um, parts of the industry overhead that must be paid? Sorry, just to confirm, I understood the question, if we receive assistance from the foundation, correct? Yeah, and they're specifically asking if there's financial gaps, I'm assuming in the, in the, when you do your gap analysis, so they're asking if there's financial gaps. Yes, gap. yes, we do. So what, um, and again, there's a lot of processes that we've implemented, and I didn't want to get into the needy greedy because it could get pretty boring in this presentation, but specifically for the gap funding, the way we have set it up is, at study startup, um, we do a gap funding analysis with the CRA and Shai and the PI. We look at what would be the true cost of the study. What are the funds that we expected to, to get from the sponsors from the study? And then what's the gap funding? Um, so the process we put it through is first look to see if there's any funding set aside by the PI for this project. So for example, PIs have a lot of residual funds that they can use for it. If the PI doesn't have any other funds to use for this project, then the next place we go to is to look at section specific residual funds. So these are the residual funds from industry funded trials. Um, if there is funds in that bucket and the section deems this study as a priority, for example, then we would take money out of that bucket or put money aside out of that bucket. And if that second line of funding is not available, then we would go into GFCC or our Guerin Family um, Cancer Center. And we have separate processes set up with our GFCC as to how we um, estimate what funding gap will be applicable to a specific study. And then how do we set the money aside? But then also how do we review in an yearly basis just because, you know, five years ago we put aside say thirty thousand dollars the cost of that trial might have changed or maybe we closed that trial so there's a uh, a constant process to go back and re-review what we've set aside whether it's at a ctsu level or at the um, foundation level which is why our relationship with the foundation um, is really really important okay um and then another question sort of on that line, do the PIs contribute a portion of their funding towards organizational overhead in addition to the 20% they contribute back to the CTSU? Um, so that's a very good question. It's a bit of a sensitive topic for us here at SickKid. So the what I have what we described in our presentation today is strictly referring to our own internal CTSU processes we've established. Um, that does not include the, the institutional overhead, which is separate. So for example, if we have an industry funded study, 
we have a budget. And so when we're negotiating the budget, we would agree, for example, a 40% overhead. Um, so that overhead comes out directly from the study cost center and it goes into the RI's um, bucket of funds, of overhead funds to, to support operational um, services for, for RI, including finance support and, and other services. Um, so the PIs would contribute to the organizational overhead separately from the process of the residual funds that I described. Um, so the residual funds will be whatever it's left over after the 40% has been taken out of the study cost center as an institutional overhead. I hope that makes sense. Okay, and I think we have two final questions. Um, one, how, are salary, how is salary supported for the managers, the finance team, your budget specialists? Um, that's a very good question. So those ones are considered because we don't do study specific work per se. Um, there are a, a core few roles within the CTSU, such as um, the manager, study budget specialist, the administrator, and we have a few lead positions as well. We have a regulatory lead uh, position, which uh, Eamon Siddiqui, um is holding at the moment. We have a COG lead. Um, and so those positions are funded directly through GFCC, through our Garen Family Cancer Center, um, not charged to study specific cost centers because that's an overall operational uh, work and oversight that we do not necessarily specifically related to um, uh, a study. Okay. And then finally, do you bill investigator sponsored studies at an hourly rate? Uh, sorry. Can you repeat the question again? Do we feel... Uh, do you bill investigator-sponsored studies at an hourly rate? Uh, let yes, me find... Yes. I, can't, I can't hear the question. Do we feel that IATs are... No, do, do we you... bill? Oh, do we bill? bill? Yes. Uh, do we... Shai, can you repeat the questions? I can not hear Renuka very well. Do you bill investigator-sponsored studies at an hourly rate? Um, so I think we use the same process for all of our studies, um, regardless of what, um, uh, what the funding... Um, uh, source is. Um, we've talked a lot about it, especially around the differences between industry funded versus consortium versus grant um, studies and whether or not it makes sense to to change the billing process or to change the way we recover CRA costs. And the reason why we've decided to apply the same process across all of our studies is because it will it helps us understand the true cost of running that research study or that clinical trial, recognizing that um, some of the underfunded trials will end up being in deficit. Um, but because we have some of the other mechanisms in place, um, that's okay. So usually a lot of the times, um, although the study goes into a deficit, we still let it be in deficit because we know there's a mechanism to, you know, bail it out of deficit, but we do want to have all the expenses of that study, including CRA time, be built into that cost center. So at the end of it, we know exactly how much it cost us. Um, so for example, one of our most famous um, IIT trials that we still have um, uh, currently going on is our TREM um, study, which is applicable to our neuron patients. Um, and definitely it's a very underfunded trial, which is in a huge deficit, but we're still applying the same process, knowing that eventually once the study closes, we need to figure out the funds um, to cover that deficit, which we already have in mind exactly how we're gonna cover that deficit. I hope that helps. That was great. I guess there's a lot of excellent feedback um, in the chat. So everyone's appreciated your talk. I'm Tell and Jackie. So sincere thanks to both of you. Um, thank you to everyone who attended the webinar as well today. And as a reminder, the survey will appear on your screen once the meeting ends. Just a few questions um, and you'll receive a certificate of attendance.
So just final note, stay tuned for CTO's um, newsletter with information on our next mentor spotlight. And with that, we'll conclude the webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much.